Yeah, we're on. Okay. So, Steve. Hi, Amit. Uh, well, welcome to everybody. Welcome to season two of the Podiatry Detective with myself and uh, the illustrious, the famous, one and only, Mr. Tulsi. How are you, sir? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad at all. I'm actually buzzing with uh, a lot going on in terms of the uh, clinic and um, as uh, as you very well know that we've... Uh, don't don't take away my question. I was just about to ask you the question. So um, we, hear, we hear you have got an amazing new premises. Do you want to tell everybody where it is? Yes, it's on Harbour High Street and um, we've literally moved out of Lord Road Surgery, which is based in Harbour, um, and we've gone to um, our uh, brand spanking new, very spacious, um, particularly very uh, specifically designed for podiatry and uh, healthcare um, on Harbour High Street. I'm actually quite jealous, you know. You've got like three rooms, you've got a massive rehab centre, you got a big TV and a sofa so you can sit down and when you haven't got patients, um, have something to eat and watch cricket all day long. Um, well, I'm hoping, nice. I'm hoping I don't get too much time to basically sit around. I'm hoping that it gets filled. So, okay. Um, now, season one. If you haven't already watched season one or listened to season one, please watch it on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. We've got podcasts. Um, and we covered quite a bit in season one. In season two, we are going to go into a lot more depth. So we're going to build on what we, what we spoke about in season one. And we're going to go into s different topic areas. Um, but we're going to go into a lot more depth in this season. Also, we've had a lot of feedback, haven't we, from season one, from podiatrists, from podiatric students, and um, from FCAs, from like, from like foot care assistants, which is great. Absolutely great. To that end, if a podiatrist or a podiatric student or a FCA wants to come on board and wants to come on video with us and ask me and Tosif any question you want about, about uh, any kind of like MSK condition, any kind of like sports injury, put us on the spot. Really challenge us. Um, and I think me and Tosif would love the challenge and we would love to help. More than anything else, we want all our fellow, like all our fellow colleagues, to really have a passion for biomechanics and MSK. Also, uh, I haven't told us if they get this, and I'm watching for his face to change in in pure horror. Um, later on next year, once the um, once the COVID nineteen situation is under control, inshallah, once it's under control, we are going to set up a day. CPD course free of charge to anybody that wants to come. And we're going to cover as many topics as we can in depth, and it's also going to include how to do assessments of the hip, the knee, the foot, including rehab. And Tosi is going to lead it, aren't you, Tosi? Well, um, anybody who's watching, this is a news to me. <laughs> <laughs> you are hearing it, so am I. But I'd love to do it, and uh, right. it's. Yeah. it's it's exactly the kind of challenges that I absolutely love. So I'd, uh, I think it'd be amazing if we can actually put something together. Um, what I was going to say is that people can comment below on, um, on our video um, and uh, they can tell us what we can actually talk about next time um, and we can create videos for them uh, and uh, we can do videos on the, on the particular topics that people are interested in. Brilliant. That's a good, really good idea. That is true. Um, I mean, look, our... The reason why me and Tosif do this um, is because we have a passion to just teach others, um, not only podiatrists and foot care assistants and, and other students. We want other patients to understand why we do what we do and take away a lot of the um, mystery behind what podiatrists and physios do. So to that end, I am going to start. I think uh, I, would, I wanted to kind of clarify one thing is that uh, um, yes. The theme of these uh, these talks and uh, these videos um, is that uh, Abid creates one presentation um, and I create the second one. Um, and uh, whoever creates the presentation is the one who leads the presentation. So um, if you see in particular that one person is a little bit more quieter than the other one, then that means that uh, they are uh, they're not in the leading uh, seat for that week. Yeah. 
Um, very true. Um, we are going to, you can hear some background music. If it gets too much, tell me and I'll switch it off. I wanted to start off with season two with some background music. And I like, um, uh, I like this slide. Just bear with me a second. I would have, um, preferred, I would have preferred that Pink Panther uh, sort of music. I would have liked that. So the, <laughs> this is actually the background score to Sherlock, the, the actual TV series. And I, I actually thought, I thought it was quite uh, good. And we've got four different uh, detectives there. We are going to focus on sporting photo pediatrics. By the way, and, by the way, just to actually talk about Sherlock, um, I read in the news uh, the other day um, that um, they are actually suing Amazon. Uh, people are suing Amazon for uh, making Sherlock, the character, too nice. So uh, I suppose, I mean, you can't be too nice. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not too nice. <laughs> I'm quite the opposite, but never this. Okay, so we are going to focus on MSK related uh, pathologies in children. Now, First of all, advice to parents and to podiatrists. For parents, this is really important. I think it's important for parents to understand what is happening to their child so they can break through a lot of that medical jargon and they can take ownership of it because often parents come to a podiatrist or to physio or to a GP and the language used may send fear inside the parent more than the child thinking, oh my God, what's happening to my child? If you have a greater understanding of common pathologies that, that, that occur in children, it will put your mind at ease. Um, that's the first thing. Podiatrists, this will be interesting. First of all, this is not as hard as everybody would bloody make you believe, right? You don't need a PhD in this. You need to have a real good interest in this. You have to be interested in this and... Um, that goes a long way. Um, you can help your patients. That being said, it is important to diagnose, treat, and refer on when appropriate. If you feel as though you are um, out of your depth, it's fine. Just say you're out of your depth. Find a colleague. If you're in private practice, find some colleagues that can help. If you're in the NHS, there, there are departments that can help. Um, this is by no means a definitive guide. I, mean, I think refer is a very big part of that treatment plan um, mm. when we deal with the kids. And I, I believe that kids who actually walk through, if they have MSK conditions, there is a very good likelihood that uh, they've been flagged in the NHS before, they're under children's hospital or under uh, um, uh, an orthopedic uh, pediatrician. So if there is anything that you're concerned about, then um, do refer on because that is part of the treatment plan. I find in private practice, by the time they come to myself, and I see a fair bit of children um, for two different reasons, and I'm going to go into it in a minute. By the time they've come to me, they've already been around the block. So they've, they've been to NHS departments, um, and I get everything from the ages of like four or five all the way up to um, 17, 18. Um, but I, I do feel that. You are right. If, if you feel as though you can't diagnose properly uh, and justify your diagnosis and justify your treatment plan, then you should refer on. Um, physiotherapy may be an appropriate place to refer on or part of pediatrics. Um, okay, so first of all, fundamentals. Children are not mini adults. This is so important. Um, this is not another step on the ladder. You're dealing with a completely new ecosystem here. Um, and they grow and mature at different rates. I, let me just see if I think I've missed something out. Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, they grow, and that's going to be important in a minute when we talk about growth spurts. Um, injury patterns are, are going to be unique to the growing musculoskeletal system. And more importantly, if you know the injury pattern, you can do an early modification uh, and treatment that can prevent any future problems. Um, would you agree, Tosi? Yep, definitely. Okay. 
Uh, my interests. Now, I have been specialising in MSK since 1995. Uh, I'm the head of sports science at the Birmingham Youth Sports Academy. So I see a lot of footballers. We have 400 footballers. I have a team under, underneath me, so I see a lot of footballers with injuries. So that's primarily um, my focus of interest. We have male and female football teams, uh, and this keeps me quite busy. Also, I have an MSc in Sports and Exercise Medicine and a PG Cert in Quadratic Sports Medicine. Um, but, uh, since, uh, since last time we did uh, our um, the Podiatry Detective, we brought yeah. that in the um, MSc's, haven't we? Yes, you finished off your MSc in biomechanics. Clinical biomechanics uh, and, uh, clinical and in, uh, um, sports and exercise medicine. So, so yeah, we have got MSCs now. <laughs> does that does that? Do you think that now that we've got this certificate, we feel a bit more important, a bit more knowledge? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But it it was a good achievement to have. Um, yeah, it is. Work, it is. Um, it's, it's been for me. It's been going on for a little while and. Uh, um, lockdown actually helped me to uh, put an end to it and uh, just put it all together and um, get it done basically. You and did uh, a wonderful dissertation on shin pain and like and like medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, his dissertation he should uh, make it public because it's really really good. Uh, he did a like uh, a like uh, SLR didn't you? I did. Yes. Literature review. Uh, really worth to read. Um, if I can convince him to uh, publish it. I did my uh, project on something opposite to feet and legs, uh, concussion, which is one of my passions, which I'm going to talk about at some stage, because I've, I've seen it so many times in recreational football, um, and um, it's so poorly managed in recreational football compared to professional football. So um, this is something that we will talk about, and it moves away from our uh, core things that we do. Um, now, growth and maturation. Growth. This is, I'm going to go some, over some of the basics and they're, they're very important to understand why. Changing the size of the body as a whole and specific parts of the body. Uh, height and weight are primary indicators of growth status. And this is a quote uh, by a chap. Melina at 2004. Maturation is towards, it's a progress towards a biological mature state. And this does varies, this varies amongst tissue organs and body systems. Uh, and we can use it as an indicator for uh, puberty. And it can express a height as a percentage of the adult height. Um, now, why am I talking about this? The reason why I'm talking about this is this study here. This study was done by Martina Johnson, 2016. Now, they look at the PHV, which is the peak height velocity, and they look at the incidence of growth-related injuries, and these were the Aspatar athletes. They, you'll see that during the growth spurt, they have the most um, injuries and they have the most problems. This is, this comes in, this is very interesting information to know and it can, it can aid in your clinical management. And I've put teenage, I'll put teenage awkwardness there for a reason. Also, um, boys reach their uh, peak height at, at like 11 to 17, girls are from like nine to 15. Regarding teenage awkwardness, can you hear me all right? I'm thinking about switching to music. I must say that I'm finding the, the music a little bit too overpowering. I, maybe I should have switched it off. Um, I'm, I think it's just going to run once and then it's going to stop. So in future, in future presentations, I won't have it on. And I'm hoping everybody can still hear us. Teenage awkwardness is something that I see when they're footballers. They go through this growth spurt and suddenly they become like... They lose balance when they're playing football. They don't have the same a touch on the ball. Uh, they, they fall down a lot more easier. Um, and they, it's because they're growing quite rapidly and they don't have that same control around the glutes and the quads. And you, I find that suddenly over, well not even suddenly, over a course of a couple of months, you'll see that this particular player is not as slick as he or she was previously on the ball. 
Um, this is bugging me. All right, let me see if I can switch this off for a second. All right, you can tell us some jokes while I'm switching off this music. We'll see. Uh, jokes and me. Jokes and you, yes, jokes and you. Unfortunately, I'm a very try and make them try and make them clean, please. Um, uh, I don't know any jokes. <laughs> I know what your jokes are like. Try and make them a bit clean. Okay, let's see. Can you see the screen? I All right. Can. Now let's just move this on forward. I'm gonna get so I'm gonna get so many podiatrists saying, "Oh my God, they were amateurs." Yeah. You know, we have these like we have these podiatrists that are like going around like uh, with their little badges to to to, to tell off other podiatrists. <laughs> um, okay, so as I was talking about teenage awkwardness, yeah. So they they go through this growth spurt uh, and suddenly they're um, they're not as slick on the board anymore. And when you get them to do a squat or a single leg squat, there's a big change in those couple of months. Um, is there anything else that you want to add to this? No. Okay. Um, let's move forward. Now, this is a very interesting study by Price et al. in 2004. It looks at two conditions, and I'm going to go through these in a bit more detail a bit later. One is Sever's disease, which is heel pain. One is Osgood Shackler's disease, which is knee pain, both which are very, very common. Now, if you look at it, at uh nine and ten years old a lot of these kids are getting heel pain and at the age of 11 they start to get knee pain okay and then if you look at uh 12 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 a lot of them are getting osgood shuttler's disease so the prevail the age when these when these patients are presenting with these these types of problems is very, very interesting. Now this study, was, this study was done in youth football and there's a lot to be said about the kind of load that's being placed on joints at a very young age. Um, we're gonna move on because this is a quite a big presentation. If, if you wanna stop me at any stage, you'll see, please feel free to stop me. I'm gonna go over some more basics. Uh, apophysitis. Now apophysis is where the normal bro um, bone outgrows from. Um, and it's where the tendon or the ligaments attach, okay? Apophysitis is when you get inflammation of this apophysis. Hap uh, happens in immature skeletons. Uh, the contraction force at, at the site of the tendon attachment causes microtrauma, and that can lead to issues. Um, so this is the underpinning of all that podiatrists do. And this is a quote by Lawrence, B. Harkless, who's the founding dean and professor of the podiatric medicine surgery at um, California. You find what you look for and you look for what you know. And I think this is such a good quote. It was introduced to me by um, Trevor Pryor, who I'm a big fan of. Um, if you don't know something exists, you won't look for it. So it, is, it sounds so simple. But um, it goes to show that we as podiatrists should be always uh, extending our scope of knowledge, um, always working on trying to learn more because you never, no matter how many years you've been doing this for, um, you can always learn more. Um, By the way. Sorry? You know, I like quotes and uh, stuff. Yeah. I really like it. Okay, the first case study. Aha. 13 year old boy presents with right. Anterior knee pain, which is near the front, it's been getting worse over the last four weeks. Any idea what that is? I want to put you on the spot. Uh, you do, really. All right. That's a good Shackler's disease. All right. Take, uh, take this forward. Okay, that's good Shackler's disease. No. In Chillingham. In fact, actually, I'm learning as everybody else is learning from you. So you take it away. Okay. Um, I see a fair bit of this in football okay uh in girls and boys actually um and it is the patella tendon when it attaches to the tibial tuberosity you can see on the x-ray there they'll get uh pain on squatting and lunging movements um you'll often find that the quads are quite tight the hamstrings are quite tight 
uh, it's a gradual onset um, and happens a lot to younger footballers and we tend to just do uh, rest, ice, activity modifications is very, very important. Now, why is it important to diagnose this correctly? This was a study done by a Goldemart, Gold Hammeret et al, 2019. 60% of patients four years post-diagnosis were still getting daily pain from Osgood Shatler's disease. 60% is a high percentage. Um, so, and four years after the diagnosis, this is now we're talking that these kids are almost ad ad adults. Um, so it's important that it is managed effectively. And the management, as what we've spoken about in uh, season one, a lot of it is peace and love, baby. And a lot of this we've been through before. Um, and it's about uh, optimizing load, um, initially elevating, compressing, avoiding anti-inflammatories, optimism, exercise, uh, education, 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 trying to modify activity patterns. Now, I, I might not necessarily stop the footballer from playing altogether. I might change the warm up. I might change other things they're doing. I might, I might try and prevent them doing any jumping activities. I might try and um, get them to dial back any jumping for headers. Anything else that's going to put a lot of force through the patella tendon at the front of the knee. Um, case two. Similarly, this is a 13 year old boy. Two weeks of pain at the front of the knee, worse after playing football, the pain is on the inferior pole of the patella. This is Singdin Larsen Johansson syndrome. This is another traction apophysitis. It's a pediatric version of jumper's knee. I made a video recently of a chap who, of a, of a kid who, who, who I'm managing at the moment, that's on my Facebook and YouTube. Um, who's got Singdin Larsen Johansson syndrome, and um, he he responded quite well to to the rehab that we did for him. Um, and as uh, as previously as with Osgood Shatler disease, they tend to have quite tight quads and uh, hamstrings, and we work on the VMO, which is the vastus medius oblique muscle. Um, and we're doing other things around education and around uh, reducing the actual uh, swelling as well. Anything to add, Tosif? No? Okay, cool. You're gonna add to this one. I'm gonna make you add to this one. This is a 10 year old boy, um, right foot pain, worse while playing football in the heel. What do you think this is? So do I go as generic uh, to make you laugh like heel pain? Or do yeah, I well, specifically? What, like what, what is the, what is, yes, Severs, yes. <laughs> Severs, calcaneal apophysitis. Uh -huh. So it's posterior plantar aspect of the heel. And this is actually the Achilles tendon right at the insertion. Um, the squeeze test, we squeeze the heel like this and um, you can, it will elicit a lot of pain. Uh, it's normally a clinical diagnosis. I, I've wrote down self-limiting two to eight weeks. I've had patients where it's taken me months to get them better. Um, uh, I've, I have yet to cast a individual or put them in a boot. Um, it fuses when they're 14 to 15 years old. Um, it generally occurs a lot in boys ages nine to 11. Now, differential diagnosis. Let's put you on the spot. Name me one thing. What else it could be, they'll say. Well, generally, the Achilles tendinopathies and stuff like that uh, are very common in the, the ages uh, of these patients. So, um, growth spurt. Abdullah, by the way, um, Abdullah started doing 5K with me um, recently when the lockdown actually started. And he started running around uh, um, and he ended up developing service. Um, mm. But he's settled down because his dad is an amazing podiatrist. Um, he's settled down like uh, in amazingly in no time. Uh, um, I see these quite often in the clinic and uh, often it's a very simple sort of uh, taking the traction off, um, uh, off the Achilles insertion um, does the job. So regarding differential diagnosis, I would be looking at inflammatory arthritis or okay. stress fracture. Do you um, mean, uh, idiopathic um, arthro arthropathy is... Uh, but they would, they would come with uh, other symptoms, other parts of the body as well. 
if they've got psoriasis, if they've got anything else like that, um, we may be looking at something like that. Yeah. Um, as you can see, it shows up, uh, it shows up on MRI um, with some edematous changes. Uh, you can see exactly the site of pain across there and the x-ray, that's not a broken heel, that's actually the apophysis. Um, so this is a 10 year old footballer. He's getting pain on both feet on the outside of his foot. It gets worse with activity and training indoors. This is Islin's disease. This is another traction apophysitis of the fifth metatarsal. It uh, happens a lot in physically active boys and girls, age of eight to 13. Uh, the peroneus brevis attaches there. So that's the site of attachment. That's why it uh, becomes quite uncomfortable. It fuses at 11 years old in girls and 14 in boys. The physical examination is very, very important. Um, you get this pinpoint tenderness there uh, when you evert them. So you push the foot out and you push the foot down. Um, it'll, it'll get a lot of pain when you're doing um, resisted eversion and extreme plantar flexion. Um, I, to be fair, I don't see this very often. I have seen it. Uh, at my time at BYSA, it's not a very common condition. Um, yeah, maybe. when I was in the National Health and um, I used to cover uh, a Beats Clinic um, for my colleagues, um, that's when I've seen it, but in private practice I haven't seen it much. Um, okay, now this is, we're going to talk about some general stuff here about, about how we manage apophysitis injuries. And as I said before, and which is why I spoke about growth and maturation, this generally occurs, occurs at the age of nine to 14. Um, you can get stiffness, aching, sharp pain at the end of sessions. It can feel better at the end of the warm-up, actually, um, it's in some players. Um, and we tend to modify activity, some rehab, and we stop impactful loading. Um, case four. Uh, now, going into a little bit more detail, uh, as people are managing uh, something like this at home, uh, uh, taping tend to do a really good job. Uh, um, so just a lateral aspect of um, the foot, just taping it a couple of layers, and um, I think that that's quite helpful. Uh, okay, <laughs> I've, I I have I have I've started to move away from taping, although I do apply it at times. And I think um, um, the only the only exception is uh, knee taping, McConnell taping for knees. Um, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about taping, just like I have with acupuncture now, and all these other things that I used to do a lot of. Um, but if if it helps a patient, I mean, just touching a patient will help a patient. Um, but if it helps, then why not? It's uh, it's. Uh, of a big management plan uh, yeah. you taping as in isolation of course but um, it's all about um, putting, putting the pieces together um, in, in a bigger management plan absolutely um, this is a 14 year old boy he's got two month history of left thigh and groin pain um, comes in to the clinic he's got a limp intermittent knee pain now this is a it's called a slipped upper capital femoral epiphysis. When you speak to um, physios, they will call it a Sufi injury. And when you speak to Muslims about a Sufi, it's completely different. So this is, this is not the same Sufi that most Muslims know. Um, this is a Salter Harris growth plate injury. Occurs more in, more in boys than girls. Occurs more in Afro-Caribbeans than Caucasians. And I'm going to go into a bit more depth about this because this is one of, the, one of those red flag conditions that I think we should talk more about. Yeah. I have seen it once, um, and um, it was something that once you've seen once, you never forget. Um, they present with groin and thigh pain. Now, they will also get knee pain, and sometimes the child won't even talk about the groin pain because they'll find it embarrassing. So you see, this is a lot about the clinical history taking. They'll talk about the knee pain, and the obturator nerve runs on the inside of the knee. Okay, a good way to test this is similar when we do the um, when we do the like slump test. We get them in that position, put our uh, hand on top of their head, uh, neck, and push them down, and then just push the leg out. 
and then get them to lift their head up. If they complain of the same sort of pain, uh, then it might be the obturator nerve. It's quite rare to damage that in a child, but it can happen. Um, but the important sign is you get, they get a decreased hip range of motion. So, and the leg will go into external rotation, which is called a Draymond sign. Uh, and they'll have this abnormal leg length, leg length discrepancy because it's externally rotated. Um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about this. This is uh, often dealt with surgically. However, um, the complications are 90% of them can have OA in the hip afterwards, and they can have avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Um, 10 to 15 percent of them get that. The other one not to miss is Perth's disease, which is when the blood supply to the neck of the um, femur is disrupted. Yep. Uh, sorry, head of the femur, take that back. And you get avascular necrosis. I thank God have never seen this. Have you ever seen this? I haven't seen it, but um, it's, it is a one big, big, big uh, red flag, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I, I think, I, I, I actually think some physios would find it hard to diagnose. Forget about podiatrists. Um, it, is, it is something that, because we don't see enough of it, uh, I think people don't look out for it. But it's something that if you are seeing enough children, you need to have a knowledge of it. Um, is there anything else you want to add to Perth's disease? For me, when um, kids uh, complain of uh, hip pain, it always means red flags to start off with. So I want to mm. keep a very close eye on it. Uh, I want to um, get uh, other people involved with it uh, in terms of pediatricians and stuff who have uh, the ability to do some imaging and stuff like that uh, um, rather quickly to, um, to, to basically, um, what's the word that I want to use? Uh, um, to tick off that it's not Perth is too easy to take yeah. off that, uh, to rule out basically um, mm. the conditions. Uh, so, so for me, um, kid, uh, any, anything around the hip area means uh, that you need to look at it in a bit more detail. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, case five, 14 year old boy. He's got insidious onset of medial, which is on the inside, right side of knee pain. It's getting worse, can't run now. Osteochondritis desiccans, which is osteochondral lesion. Um, this is pathological lesion affecting the co articular cartilage and the subchondral bone. Um, it often occurs in the knee, okay? Uh, and in the shoulder and in the ankle bone, uh, in the talus. Um, this, this is one of those red flags that you need to keep an eye on for. Um, and in the juvenile form, age 10 to 15 years old, it can happen. Um, case six, 15 year old footballer, sharp four foot pain while playing football, unable to play and limped off the field. I've seen a fair few of these. And it's a metatarsal fracture. It accounts for a, l a high percentage of pediatric um, um, foot pain, uh, four foot pain, 60%. Uh, according to Ramelt et al. Um, and the most common mechanism for metastasis fractures in the children population is either a fall or a twisting athletic activities. The first and fifth metastasis are most frequently fractured in children and commonly occur in isolation. They represent 58 to 67 percent of all met fractures in children. The second, third and fourth metastasis are commonly associated with concomitant metastasis fractures, according to Owen et al. in 1995. Is there anything else you want to add to that? No, that's very no? straightforward. But, okay. Sometimes, when you hear hoofbeats, you think hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. When you hear hoofbeats, <laughs> think horses, not zebras. Now, sometimes no, it like, can be... Sometimes you got to explain this to me. I was reading this and I was thinking, right, I need to... I am, I didn't get it. So often, if you hear hoofbeats, what's the first thing you think of? 
Think of a horse, don't you? You don't think of a zebra, all right? But sometimes it can be a bloody zebra, all right? So you need to have your mind, you, you have to have your mindset ready. So the other causes of four foot pain can be Freiburg's disease which is a rare condition that affects primarily the second and third metatarsals. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, happens a lot in adolescence. You can get flattening of the head of the metatarsal on x-ray, actually. Common symptoms include pain and stiffness at the front of the foot, which can lead to a limp. Uh, and you may get swelling, limited range of motion, um, and it's triggered by weight-bearing activity. Often occurs during a growth spurt at puberty, and look at the male to female ratio of this. Females get this five times more than males do. Yep. At least something is females are getting more than men. Um, this is according to Katcherin uh, et al. 1994. Now, I, I've, I've seen this in kids, but I've seen this in grown adults because females then get pain later on. And when you send them for x-ray, you'll see the flattening, which when then we're injecting with, um, with corticosteroid injection to try and ease the discomfort. I've seen, I was lucky enough to watch a, a fluoroscopy injection for a lady who had, Fry, who had pain from an old Freiburg's infarction. Uh, and there she was in her 40s now. Uh, and that was quite interesting. Have you seen this before? Yes, I have. And um, when I did my um, injection therapy, it was um, mentored uh, by um, a chap in Warsaw. Um, he did it under fluoroscopy, and uh, it was quite amazing to see. Yeah, I, I do. When one day we are going to buy a C arm and have it in clinic, and we're going to do this, and we'll find somebody to teach us somewhere. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, this one. This one I actually spoke to you recently about. Uh, it's a 15-year-old fast bowler, cricketer, comes with lower back pain. Parents think he's got back pain because of flat feet. This is a massive red flag. It's a pause injury. It's definitely one, not one to miss. And I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about this in detail because it's something I find fascinating. It's a spinal fracture of the pars interarticulars. Um, and it's likely due to a failure of the bone to adapt to repetitive mechanical stress and insufficient time to repairing the, uh, which can lead to biological factors need to be considered. This is by Berger and Doyle in 2019. This, there is a disproportionately high incidence of pars injuries in the young elite athletic population with reported figures ranging from eight to 47%. Now, when you see this in footballers, it tends to be on both sides. When you see this in cricketers, it tends to be on one side, and it tends to be, um, if it's a, it tends to be a fast bowler. I've never seen this in a cricketer, sorry, in, uh, in a batsman. It's always a fast bowler. And it tends to be the side, if they're right-handed fast bowler, it tends to be in the side that they cock the arm back to bowl. So it'll be on that side at the bottom of the, uh, at the bottom of the spine. So okay. how we assess this, I can tell you was you were a fast bowler. I can't wait to bowl to you one day. You know this year. Dossi 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 feels as though he should have been picked for England because he's 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 such a good leg spinner. So I and a good batsman. Like he scored century after century. So I can't wait to bowl to him. Um, challenges, I mean, uh, It's an open challenge on uh, on this. I'd hit you for six sixty on six more. Uh, even at my old age, and I am old now, I don't think you'll hit me for sixes. Okay, this is the way I assess this, yeah? I, I get the patient uh, standing, and I gently put my hand on the upper back, and I get them to lean back, so go into extension, and they might complain of pain. I will then get them to lift up one leg and lean back and see if they're going to pain then the other leg. Then I'll get them to lift up the back and rotate and lean back. And they'll often complain of pain. Um, that's your clinical diagnosis, but I feel this needs other things. Now, it'll be uh, other, other imaging. Now, um, as I've said before, it'll be a gradual onset. There'll be a recent change in load and growth. They'll, they've gone through a growth spurt and they're playing loads of football, loads of cricket, bowling loads of all 
like ulvas, tends to be central back pain, uh, unilateral, so it could be on one side, pain with extension and rotation. Um, they'll get pain when they're jumping, hopping, running, anything with high impact activities. Um, if you get parents coming to you, podiatrists, and say, my son's got lower back pain and he's got flat feet, right? You need to start doing these tests. Now, very often it's not this, okay? There are other reasons for lower back pain in children, but you need to know that this exists, okay? Um, initial, off, initial management would be to offload from impact activities, uh, ensuring that ADLs are minimized, uh, aggravating ADLs are minimized, ensure that they educate the parent and the child, uh, update the coaching staff, especially if my cricketer was uh, in an academy actually. Um, so you need to speak to, you can't do this on your own. You need to speak to physios, coaches. Uh, you, you, you will write to the GP, but the GP would hardly ever read the letter. So you need to get in touch with their club. So um, their physio and other people in that club. I would uh, say that um, usually if they are under a setup, um, mm. if they're playing for Warwickshire, for example, they have a very good network uh, of people who are managing them, um, the medical team. Um, <clears throat> one of the things which leads to these uh, issues, especially in young kids, is uh, their workload. So if yeah. the workload isn't managed uh, properly, they will end up having these issues, these injuries. Um, so um, if they're just playing club cricket and uh, just playing for fun, then I suppose you have to keep an eye on it yourself and then uh, seek help if, um, if there is any problem. Clubs wouldn't really have uh, um, the kind of setup where they have um, a physio or a podiatrist or anybody on board to be able to yeah, help these kids. Um, so, so some of the recreation clubs, you are right, the elite, the difference between elite, uh, elite, uh, sub-elite, and recreational is huge. Now, when you get to sub elite, even even uh, in cricket and football, when you're when you're talking uh, teams that are not at the higher echelons um, of their particular sport, they, you may have one physio if you're lucky. All right, that physio will be covering everybody. All right, in the recreational, generally you have nobody. So in that stage, you're you're then speaking to the parent and the coach because there'll be a coach. Um, and it will be the same coach. Depends, uh, that depends. Um, if I give you an example of Harborn, Harborn runs, uh, Harborn has got several uh, coaches uh, who basically coach these kids. Some people are under their uh, coaching, some people aren't. Um, they play for their schools and uh, um, they come to Harborn and they play in the uh, Harborn team. So it, it all very much depends on the individual club and where they are and what sort of setup they are in. Um, the league has uh, put restrictions on uh, for these kids. For example, anybody who's like 14 can't bowl uh, any more than uh, five to six overs in, um, in, a, success, uh, in a succession, uh, basically, or regularly. They have to take a break and then they have to come back on it uh, again and they have maximum uh, number of overs that they can bowl in, in a game. Um, so, so there are systems in place. But um, if, if they're playing at a recreational sort of level, they have to um, look around and they have to find uh, um, a physiotherapist, a podiatrist, uh, um, a healthcare professional who deals with these sort of injuries um, by themselves. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how it does in cricket because I, I see more footballers in cricket. So in, I'll give you an example. In the Birmingham Music Sports Academy, we've got like hundreds of kids. We've got different coaches for different teams and different levels. But we've got a head female coach and a head male coach. So when I want to, like, for example, recently I, I, I wanted to integrate the FIFA under 11's uh, warm-up uh, protocol that they've, that they've done to, to uh, minimise injuries. I went to the head coaches first, and that was then trickled down further on. Um, some of the other football clubs I've worked with, when, when, I, have a, when I have an issue with a, uh, a particular child and the particular child presents with something, I will go to the head coach and then the head coach will then um, uh, speak to the individual coaches from the different clubs. 
Um, I find that although there is a restriction on young kids bowling more than six overs, uh, when they're in the park, they're bowling a lot more than that. So when they're working, when, when they're playing with their friends and stuff, like that, that's 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 the point of education. That's that's the point of trying to educate them and the parents themselves. Um, so the prognosis and return to play generally based on clinical symptoms and correlates with imaging and healing time frames. Stress responses and early incomplete fractures can completely heal radiologi radiologically. However, bilateral complete fractures can progress to non-union and re-imaging may not be required. Factors such as age, uh, stage, level of injury, uh, status, um, can have an impact on prognosis. Now, a couple of more slides on this. This, they have, they have characterized this via MRI as grade zero to four. Uh, I generally haven't seen anything beyond a grade two. Um, I haven't seen a grade three and four. Uh, I think I would have to speak to other colleagues to refer on if I saw something that uh, was more than a grade two. Um, but this is something I feel comfortable for with uh, managing myself, generally speaking. Okay, ACLs. Now, this isn't a case study, but I wanted to talk about ACLs. It's, what, it's one of the main ligaments providing stability of the knee. According to 2014 AAP clinical report, uh, the risk significantly increases at 12 to 13 years of age, especially uh, in girls and 14 to 15 year olds in boys. Teenage girls are at high risk of getting ACL injury. This is something that I have been speaking to our female coaches about um, because we have teenage girls there that are playing and because this tends to happen because muscles are, muscles are, are used differently with uh, jumping and landing, women are six times more likely to get an ACL injury. Uh, and there's a there is a like a quote there. Um, I've wrote patella dislocation because at this moment in time I am managing a child. Well, he's 15 years old. He had a patella dislocation. He was in a brace. Can't get a F NHS physio to see him because of COVID. So I've been doing the rehab with him, um, and we are eight weeks into rehab. Um, and this is going to be a long rehab process. Um, it is, it's, it starts off very basic and then we move it on. He is close to return to play actually. Well, return to practice, not return to play. Um, there's two reasons why the knee swells up really badly uh, from an injury. Either it's an ACL or it's like patella dislocation. These are the two reasons why it will just blow up like a balloon. And this definitely needs a presentation on its own. Uh, I, I have rehabbed pulse ACL rec uh, like reconstructions and it's not easy. Okay, um, this has been a long presentation. And my um, final thoughts. Um, it's important to recognize children's pathologies. Uh, be sensitive to language especially please colleagues be sensitive with what you say to parents and children when you, if you put in a fear factor into a child at a young age you this is going to have significant implications onto them when they're older um and the interactions this child is having at this age um can can have massive implications onto other conditions that they, they may get into adulthood um Seek help from MDT or refer on if you're not sure. Um, and there's lessons to be learned from each interaction. Now, I'm going to add one more thing into this before we have a conversation. Um, me and Tosif are quite comfortable with rehab because we've been doing it for like 20 years. Uh, and um, I myself have done an MSc in sports and exercise medicine, so I've done a lot of rehab. Um, if you are not comfortable with doing rehab and progressive rehabilitation with goals, with, with goals set at each single stage, then you should refer on. Sorry, Joseph. Just to correct you, 
um, that um, Abid is the older one. Uh, he's done it for 20 years. I look younger. I am the youngest one, uh, uh, so I've only done it for 10 years. I don't want to be looking older than you, do I? You, you've, 10 years is a long time to be doing, to be doing what you've been doing. So, um, and you've done, you've primarily focused on this as well. So obviously I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I feel comfortable with doing this, but I do have a network. I have a network of good world-class physiotherapists around me. I'm blessed. I have, a, I have some really good like radiographers that I can turn to. And I have, an, I have a really good like support structure when I am um, stuck, when I uh, have got any doubts. Uh, thank you very much. Tosif, feel free to talk because I cannot talk anymore. So, um, um, I would thank you very much for this talk. I must say that I really enjoyed it. Um, being working with the kids uh, in the National Health a little bit and then privately, um, I do focus, um, I do see lots of um, foot and ankle conditions, knee conditions, but I don't really, uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, hips and backs and stuff. It's not something which comes through as, as often. Uh, although I've started working with cricketers a bit more, um, I'm going to be involved with the cricket side of the things with the club and stuff. So it's, um, I'm going to start to get involved in these and I'm going to start to see these things. So thank you for uh, educating us on that, uh, that part. I really enjoyed it. Um, and um, yeah, great job. Thank you very much for your kind comments. Um, I'm sure I have made some mistakes along the way. If I have, please excuse me. Um, uh, I, uh, I have, it's been done with the best of intentions. Um, any final points? My, I think my knowledge of uh, photopatriotics has really increased by working with children in, in like BYSA at, at other football clubs. Um, and obviously after doing my, after doing my MSc, um, if you are, if you're a parent, uh, and if you have any questions regarding anything I've said to you today, and you think, okay, my child's got this, uh, and he said something that I don't understand, please turn to myself or to Tosif, and we'll try and help. Um, just drop us an email. If you're a podiatrist or a full care assistant or anybody else, and you've said, and you have any questions about anything we've said, please, please feel free to contact us uh, via email or via direct message. Um, um, and we'll try and have a conversation about it. Um, as I said, it's really important to have a support structure around you, in private practice especially. It's important if you're dealing with children to have, have physiotherapists around you that are of a high calibre. So um, you can have a multidisciplinary team. With the NHS, it's a lot more easy. Everything's already pre-built for you. In private practice, you have to create these multidisciplinary teams around you, um, which is great. Well, um, I'm quite blessed. Um, being part of Movement Therapy Clinic, I think... Uh, we have several uh, other therapists who specialise in, in different things, uh, um, and uh, yeah, I've got um, clinicians on hand uh, who can assist and help. Brilliant. Um, as I said at the beginning of this video, if you've got any questions and you want to come onto video with us, come onto video with us. Finally, uh, Tosif mentioned cricket. Now we are going to be creating um, a whole series of videos focusing on cricketing injuries. And it's going to be really interesting. Um, and uh, this is something that we're going to do later on this year or next year, we'll see. Um December, I've blocked, um, I've blocked the uh, two weeks off in December. And hopefully with my new clinic coming along, I've got a lot of um, work to do with regards to the marketing and uh, the website and everything else. If I am on top of it by that, um, we're, going to start, um, we're going to start in um, December. So if you have... If you're a patient and you're watching this, if you have a cricketing injury and you want to be assessed free of charge, as long as you don't mind being on video, um, give us a contact, contact us and we'll get you into clinic and we'll do a full assessment on you, including ultrasound scan and a lot of other, a lot of other things as well. If you are a podiatrist or a foot care assistant and you have some patients who are cricketers who've got injuries, please feel free to, to contact us and we will, we will contact them 
and as long as they don't mind being on video because that's, that is one of the conditions um, we would love to get them into clinic and do some real life um, real life examples of um, rehabbing and treating and assessing and cricketing injury um, thank you very much for listening to both myself and don't Lucy. forget to watch us next week uh, where we are going to be presenting rheumatoid arthritis. So I'll be leaving in that, in that presentation. I I am I'm intending not to talk at all. I'm intending to listen and learn from you. Um, and so I am just going to be quiet. So there you go. I, I, your input will be very much welcomed. Um, so I think um, I think let's do uh, rheumatoid arthritis next week, and um, we'll uh, onwards and upwards. Hey, hey, take care. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye.